your tailor needs to give you a little bit extra room just so that we don't know the exact size of the iPhone 12 in your pocket. Megan McPeak, what are you doing in the gym these days? I'm actually working on flipping my uh, workout plan around, so that's a stay tuned. Mm. Oh, I thought you were going to say I'm working on flipping a big 600-pound <laughs> tractor tire, and I was going to be like, yo, good for no, you. No, I haven't done that in a while. <laughs> <laughs> D Listen, deload weeks are important. Dave Zyron, what about you? Well, I was just back inside a gym for the first time in uh, 15 months. I've spent Ooh. the last year doing more tennis and running like covid safe things so finally back in an indoor gym and i found that i've lost about 80 pounds off my bench so the goal which is a lot oh so you're, you're down to 350. ah um, <laughs> i'll be straight I'll, i'm i'm down I'm, I'm like trying to struggle with about uh 185 um really struggling to get it up and so it's about reworking the body the other thing i'm doing as long as i'm i'm going to take megan's oxygen there since megan's reworking it um, my mom is in town for the first time since COVID and my mom is 79 and we went out yesterday and we ran a mile together. Nice. So that was pretty cool to like work out with my mom. I don't think we're going to be breaking any Steve Cram records anytime soon, <laughs> but you know, Steve Cram having the mile record in 1987, the last time I checked and, but you know, <laughs> hoping for the best, uh, trying to get in shape moving forward now that people are outside in the fresh air again. Yeah, perfect. I'm like, uh, probably you and your mom might be able to beat me in a mile at this point. Uh, I'm just getting back into working out. As you guys can see, I'm back on another writing retreat. I have a couple kettlebells here in the room because the hotel gym is closed. Uh, but <laughs> the last few months for me have just been uh, an ongoing battle between me and my soleus muscle. And there are days that I feel like running and my soleus muscle says, well, I don't feel like running. There are days that I'm in the middle of a run. My soleus muscle says, I'm done. I don't care if you're not done. I'm done. Welcome back to season two, episode four of Bring It In with Morgan Campbell. I'm your host, Morgan Campbell, here in downtown Toronto, uh, joined by the best panel in the business, Dave Zirin in Washington, D.C. Hamilton's own Megan McPeak. She's also in Washington, Washington D.C., but representing the Hammer and Canada and Humber, Humber College, all very proudly. Um, <laughs> We're back for another week. A lot on the docket this week. We have the NFL draft. We have um, Canada's rising status as a football power, if that even makes sense in a league that's so American-centric. We have um, Caitlyn Jenner versus teenage trans athletes, which if you had that on your 2021 bingo card, a Go ahead. And we find out we had a way too early prediction from Dave. And uh, we get... We find out whether we're in or out on uh, more private equity in sports and whether or not we're in and out, in or out on uh, my favorite football team, the Chicago Bears, and, and the way they're handling uh, the draft. First of all, the draft, guys, um, for the dedicated, it was like two and a half whole days of football content, football coverage in the spring, um, which, is, which is why the NFL, why the NFL does it this way, right? It's a way to blanket the season, blanket the calendar with, with coverage and way to, to eliminate the offseason and keep people engaged and facilitate conversations like this. Cause uh, I'm about to ask Dave Zirin, what was your favorite moment of the NFL draft this weekend? Well, first and foremost, the NFL draft is like a meat lovers pizza with crust stuffed with cheese. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> so tempting to me and delicious. I, I'll consume the whole thing while at the same time i know it's very bad not just for me but it's bad for football we're taking the best college players in the country and putting them on the most dysfunctional teams where they're the least likely to fulfill their mighty potential so the draft is bad for a million different reasons but i can't say i didn't consume every second of it if i did i would be lying and i would never do that especially not to the good people at the cbc the part that i really loved is this is a Ravens household, a Baltimore Ravens household. And uh, we drafted a young man in the first round uh, who in college at Penn State went by the name of Jason Owe. And he announced to the world that his actual name is Adufe Owe. Jason was his middle name. And he took the name Jason at Penn State because he was actually nervous that people wouldn't be able to pronounce his name. And he says, now that I'm drafted, I'm more confident, I'm a professional, and people are just gonna have to learn how to pronounce my name. And I just I just love that swag. I love that confidence. And I love him claiming his true self and saying, I'm not, my name's not Jason. 
It's a dufe. And oh, by the way, the fact that he runs a 43740 and weighs 260 pounds, I like him for that reason too. What I noticed about him just running the way he moved and the way he's built, like we're in this era of football where like a lot of the understand these guys are still like highly muscle bound, but what Odufe away looks like is just a bigger version of a small person. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm. Like he is so well proportioned at that size and at that weight is that's what allows him to move like a guy that weighs 200, even though he weighs, you know, 235, 240. He's an amazing person. Speaking of which, you're the track person, Morgan. Just quick follow-up. is you're, you're the track person, and I just want to ask you if you believe what was being said on the broadcast. Adufe Away outweighs Devontae Smith by 100 pounds and yet has a better 40 time. you believe that, or does so that smell is, a little funny to you? So he's 270, Odufe Away. No, no, no. I'm exaggerating for a fact, oh, but he weighs sorry. about 250. Um, okay. I think if you line, if you line them up in and race, Devontae, Devontae Smith... Yeah, if you line them up and race, Devontae Smith would win. And, like, the longer the race, the, okay. the more Devontae Smith would win by. But, the, but the, like, edge rushers like that, the thing those guys have going for them and the thing that makes them special is the acceleration from a standstill. So it's not necessarily surprising that those guys run really fast 40s. Because when you watch college football, um, you know, there's one guy, one or two guys in every conference with that raw speed and um, acceleration to just – accelerate around the corner and get to the quarterback. And that's the difference between college football and the NFL is in the NFL, like that guy's on every team. And it's, it's, a, it's an amazing collection of people they're able to put together. Megan McPeak, your favorite moment from the NFL draft. Oh, for me, it was easily quitty pay with the nod to the late great Chadwick Boseman in Black Panther. Mm. Interesting. So did you now, did you watch beyond the first round of the draft? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Which... Which makes you the smartest person on this panel. I, if I'm being honest, I watched on Twitter because it was easier and didn't include commercials and still allowed me to watch what I actually wanted to watch. Which makes you even smarter than the, than the rest of us. Cause I was over here, like my work was done for the day. My brain was fried. I had the TV on, go ahead. This is the thing though. When you have Ian Rappaport and Adam Schefter breaking it before it even gets picked, I knew the picks before they were happening because of Twitter. Yes. Which... That, see, this is the thing. This is why on the NBA side, they put Adrian Wojnarowski on the actual coverage yes. so that he couldn't break the tweets <laughs> before they actually were drafted. And it's gotten a little closer, but you still have some tweets that uh, break the draft picks beforehand. But like every time a pick would come in, the tweet would happen, you know, at least 30 seconds to 60 seconds before uh, Roger Goodell would actually make the pick. So Twitter knew before the collective public watching. Yes, but that, but that's also part of the reason why, like every year, it becomes more and more of a, a pageant and a spectacle and a show. Because if you're just tuning in on your television set for the information, you're already behind. And, and this is one of the problems, you know, that leagues run into every year in terms of viewership. Is that if I want to stay connected to a game, I can go out and live my life as long as I have my phone with me. I can get updates. So you, I need more reasons to actually sit down um, and watch this thing. So this I year, what we tune had in for the fashion. Uh, well, yes. Okay, so you tell me, Megan, uh, what ranks higher, Patrick Sertan's uh, PS2 controller medallion with the gold and the diamonds, or Devontae Smith's robe suit? Uh, given the fact that you could actually see the robe suit and not the chain underneath uh, Patrick Sertan's outfit, because I I was scouring looking for pictures to see it above his bow tie dangling you never actually see it so he actually didn't have it on display to my knowledge so if that's the case i would go with uh Devante smith's robe suit which i actually thought was well put together i thought it was a nice clash of the ds uh emblem that he had pinned along with the uh pocket square that he had and the options going with the bow tie over a you know slim tie or whatnot so i would give him the nod also, for me, Patrick Sertan's pants were a little too tight. I don't need to know that you have two phones <laughs> in your pockets because they're so tight. Don't get me wrong. I know you've got big legs. I get it. You're yeah, so he can't legs. help but it, man. Yourself, He's just jacked. Give yourself, your tailor needs to give you a little bit extra room just so that we don't know the exact size of the iPhone 12 in your pocket. <laughs> he might have hit the gym in between the fitting and, and, and the draft. That's not his fault. So if you ask my favorite moment from the NFL draft, um, it had to be the fact that and this is highly personal, you know, but that the first round 
consisted of a bunch of players from the traditional powerhouses of college football. Alabama, Clemson, and Northwestern. Northwestern, my alma mater. Two people in the first round. That has never happened. That has never, ever happened. Um, Greg Newsom, the second cornerback going to Cleveland, which is my other favorite team now that he's there, especially. Um, and Rayshon Slater going to Los Angeles, where he's with the Chargers, where he's going to play with another Northwestern guy, um, Justin Jackson, who Dave knows really well. And the other thing about Rayshon Slater is that he's kind of Canadian adjacent in that his dad, Reggie Slater, played for the Raptors, like the old school Raptors, the, the uh, Sky Dome and pinstripe dinosaur uniform Raptors, Reggie Slater. This is his son, Rayshon Slater. Um, and this was another feature of this draft that you know, the broader audience didn't really pick up on, but people like us really noticed is that four Canadians were drafted, which ties a record. You had um, Javon Holland, uh, who whose dad played in the CFL. He spent his childhood uh, out West. I want to say Vancouver before he moved back to California to go to high school. Benjamin San Just uh, from Montreal. Um, Josh Palmer from Brampton, who wound up going to high school outside Miami. And Dave's guy, Chuba Hubbard. Um, Dave, is it, as, as the only person on this panel who is only American, um, are you hearing Canada's footsteps behind you in terms of being overtaken as the worldwide uh, gridiron football power? Yeah, no, <laughs> but uh, um, I mean, I would put Canada roughly behind the state of Florida um, and Texas and California and probably <laughs> some other states as well, maybe even Jersey. But Jersey I, has I a lot like of good football players. Yeah, Jersey oh, no. has a lot Jersey. of talent. Yes, Start with Paul Robeson. Who's on the all time, <laughs> but to go to Chuba Hubbard, I mean, I love Chuba Hubbard, 2000 yard runner in 2019. And he not only did he fall in the draft, but he also fell to a team, the Carolina Panthers, where he's going to be playing not only behind Christian McCaffrey, but McCaffrey was injured for a lot of last year. So his replacement, Mike Davis, turned a lot of heads, which people didn't expect. So that puts Chuba pretty low on the death chart, which I do not like because I really think he's special. And I think he dropped in the draft precisely because he was critical of his coach, Mike Gundy. Yes. Because he was critical of the culture at Oklahoma State and the culture in college football. And I hate the fact that players who take those kinds of stances at the collegiate level, it's seen as somehow of a deficit when they enter the draft situation. Instead of being like, wow, what an intelligent, independent thinker. That's exactly who we want on this team. It's, oh, he must not really like football. And that drives me bonkers. <laughs> well, it's, well, well, it's two we, things. Go, go ahead, Megan. Let's also keep in mind, we have the greatest example of that in who? Colin Kaepernick. There you go. But this is, but this is exactly <laughs> the point. Like, as it relates to Chuba Hubbard off the field, um, uh, the idea that he can speak out against racism, against injustice, is only seen as negative if you're Black. Because if you looked at the top of the draft with Trevor Lawrence. What was out front in these features about Trevor Lawrence was the fact that he yeah. was really outspoken against racial injustice, but it's because he's Trevor Lawrence. If Justin Fields had tried the same thing, it would have been one more, uh, as you mentioned, Dave, one more uh, one more penny on the, uh, this guy doesn't really like football side of the scale. And again, it's a scale that they only really bring out uh, for black athletes, not necessarily for the white ones. Like any reason to portray you as lazy, to portray you as uh, disloyal, uh, not dedicated and pay you less money, then they bring it out. For Chuba Hubbard, I, even if he wound up on the Panthers, still, like, I wish he could have done it for more money, for second round money instead of fourth round money. Megan McPeak, are we at the point where the NFL is going to become like the NBA, where every year we're going to see uh, this big cohort of Canadians that, 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 that we can kind of celebrate as uh, the coming of the next wave? As much as I would like to say yes, I am 100% on board with Dave in the sense that there's still a long way to go uh, when it comes to Canadians in the NFL on a consistent basis, much like we see with the NBA. But I don't think it's completely out of the realm. I just think we're not there yet. Um, and to your previous point, you know, the other thing too with the NFL is you think of the way that we talked about the top four quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. All we talked about was. 
Trey Lance and Justin Fields and can they play in the system? We didn't talk about if Mac Jones can actually play in the system. What's the two biggest differences between them? Skin yeah. color. <laughs> well, well, also like with Mac Jones, like that was supposed to be um, a selling point of his was that he was not spectacularly talented as an individual is that he could go in there and fit in a system. Whereas a guy like Justin Fields, because he's so talented, how do you get that guy to fit in the system? And again, the fact that you're multi-talented is only negative. If you're black and a quarterback, like no, like Trevor Lawrence can run. Trevor Lawrence can throw on the run. Trevor Lawrence can do a lot of things. No one held that uh, against him. Now in terms of Canada becoming this football power, this funny thing is happening with football. You're seeing, more Canadians in the NFL draft, more Canadians than ever at the division one level. Um, but at the, at the same time, the CFL, they are having to re- they just had a global draft. They are casting their net literally around the world, Finland, Germany, England, trying to bring talent in. So like this top tier of Canadian talent that a generation or two ago, the CFL had a chance at, they don't have a chance at those guys anymore. And one of the reasons that um, so many Canadians are, 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 are winding up on Division I rosters is that player participation numbers in football in the U.S. are down. But this machine, this football industrial complex, it needs talent. It's going to get talent from, whatever, from wherever it can and from wherever people think that coming to the U.S. to play football is an opportunity. And so you wind up with more Canadians. In the meantime, Caitlyn Jenner is back in the news. A couple of things about Caitlyn Jenner. Um, One, she wants to run for governor of California. Gavin Newsom is facing a a, a recall election. Um, And all these candidates from the right side, from not right meaning correct, but right versus left, they're lining up to try to knock off Gavin Newsom. Uh, Caitlyn Jenner uh, did an interview recently, a quick interview in a parking lot with uh, TMZ, was asked about this issue of uh, trans girls, transsexual girls playing sports. Um, and here's what Caitlyn Jenner had to say. I oppose, that's why I oppose biological boys who are trans competing in girls sports in school. It just isn't fair. We have to protect girls sports in our schools. Now this, you know, it's not an isolated incident. Like this issue of trans girls playing sports has become like, uh, a, 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 a bit of a crusade on the US political right. And I don't quite know where it comes from because we're not dealing with the, uh, like a, a huge number of people. We're talking about like a handful of people in each state. It, all of these states are passing laws uh, preventing trans girls from playing sports. Um, Dave Zyron, what do you make of uh, Caitlyn Jenner is like one of the highest profile uh, transgender individuals in the world uh, making this statement on this issue at this time? Well, there's something very shameful about a 1976 Olympian using their outsized public platform to try to actually keep people from playing sports, particularly people who um, deal with issues of exclusion and and alienation, like actually sports is an, an amazing tool to for for camaraderie i mean there's so many things we all agree on this on this panel that sports bring to the table and so denying that to folks to me is 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 terrible i mean and for an olympian in particular it's shameful i have to say like i've never seen the trans community rise up as one as they did when caitlin jenner said she was going to run for governor and they didn't rise up as one in support of caitlin jenner but in opposition (laughs) to caitlin jenner i mean she was seen as somebody on the wrong side of all the questions facing the trans community long before she made this statement or anything of the rest. And the one thing I would point out, I I could point out that uh, Caitlyn Jenner is also part of one of the most parasitic families that the United States has produced in the 21st (laughs) century, but I'm going to leave out all of that stuff to say that one one point I would make is that California has actually had laws on the books um, defending transgender students and their access to sports since 2014. And there's not one incident of somebody coming forward and saying, wait a minute, the fact that they're playing is denying my daughter, my cisgender daughter, a spot or denied my cisgender daughter a victory. That That's seven years of this law and we've seen nothing. So why bring it up? You bring it up because transgender people don't have power. You know, they're not um, they're, and, that, and that makes them very easy to scapegoat. And, you know, they tried it with bathroom bills a couple of years ago. People remember that. That didn't quite take. So now they're trying it with sports. These, this is classic wedge divide and conquer politics. It's ugly as hell. And Caitlyn Jenner is now just part of a chorus of people who want to deny access to play for a segment of the population. 
this is what amazes me like this emphasis on excluding people from sport as opposed to facilitating ways even even if you accept that it's a really thorny issue instead of trying to say well let's find a way that you can play the 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 the, the, the stance is always let's find a way to keep you out which again yeah it goes against the spirit of sport and the function of sport and the way sport the way we sell sport to kids as a way to fit in, as a way to get along, as a way to um, broaden their possibilities. Megan McPeak, does this stance alter how you feel or felt about Caitlyn Jenner? Absolutely not. It, I wasn't really a fan of Caitlyn Jenner to begin with, to Dave's point, given the family um, and everything that kind of comes with that. But that's a whole other conversation. But no, it doesn't. It doesn't change my stance. I was not a fan of Caitlyn Jenner's before this. I'm still not a fan of Caitlyn Jenner's after this. And it's really disappointing that in order to try and get into office, yeah. Caitlyn Jenner is trying to weaponize something mm -hmm. that children and teens are going through. They're fighting for their own lives on a daily basis. Their families are fighting for their lives on a daily basis because they are so excluded, not just from sports, but from life, period. Their sheer mm -hmm. existence is looked at as taboo. Their sheer existence is looked at as, you know, unwelcomed and frowned upon. So the fact that you have someone who made the decision that they wanted to announce that they are themselves in this position and transgender and didn't identify the way that they were born years ago in Caitlyn Jenner, coming out that she felt that she was more identifiable as a woman, you would think that Caitlyn Jenner would understand what these families and these children and teens and adults go through on a daily basis because Caitlyn Jenner did it in the most public forum possible. And some of these families, I don't want to make the assumption, but I feel comfortable enough making it. They don't have the same means and uh, right. access to money, quite simply and frankly, that Caitlyn Jenner did when she made the decision to come out publicly in how she felt and how she identified. These kids in these communities, the transgender LGBTQ plus community, they deal with these struggles on a daily basis. And now to alienate them from sports, I think is so unwarranted and unnecessary to do it just to simply run for office. It's quite frankly shameful on Caitlyn Jenner's part to try and weaponize something that is so, so near and dear to some people's hearts. And families lose their children because quite frankly, they can't deal with the struggle that they have to go through. And now to weaponize that, it's just shameful in my opinion. To, to, to scapegoat a group of young people who did not ask to become part of this political fight. Um, and it, and, and, but this movement is so, so, so squarely in line with what a lot of what we're seeing on the US political right in terms of inventing a problem that doesn't exist and then inventing a, 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 a then passing a bunch of laws to address this problem that never existed. This is why we have all these alleged uh, voter integrity laws, which are really aimed at stopping people from voting because the lower the voter turnout is, the better it is uh, for your right wing candidates. Um, even though by any other measure, like this last round of elections was successful, given the fact that all these people still turned out to vote in the middle of a pandemic. But you invent this problem. Like, there is no evidence that there are, you know, hundreds or thousands of uh, biologically male student athletes in every state uh, crowding girls out of sports and, and winning winning all the, all the championships. That's not what's happening. That's not at all what's happening. Now, if you are Caitlyn Jenner, I could maybe see how you could think this way. Because if you're Caitlyn Jenner and you remember 45 years ago when you were Bruce Jenner, and if Bruce Jenner reclassified in 1976 and said, well, uh, I'm a woman now, I'm going to do the heptathlon. Um, then Bruce Jenner would have beat everyone in the, in the women's heptathlon. Okay, cool. Except most people in high school sports are not the athlete that Bruce Jenner was in the 1970s. Right? We're not talking about world-class male athletes and this is the kind of thing that gets lost. Like, if you really think there's a problem, like the the, the the issue that seems to me to be at the fringe of all this is that folks, to the extent that they are actually afraid or worried about this, they think that like male athletes are going to use transgender uh, status as like a loophole um, 
to go play against uh, female athletes and dominate. Like if I'm a if I'm a sprinter that runs 10.4 in the 100 meters and I can't make the Olympic team as a man, then I go put on a dress and say, hey, I'm a woman. Now I run 10.4 and I'm the fastest in the world. Um, but if you really think that that's what's happening, then the people you need to address and the people you need to uh, police uh, are the regular mainstream males that you think are going to do this, which is a distinct group of people from someone who actually is trans and is grappling with these things and trying to find a way to fit in in high school and can find some sense of friendship and camaraderie through through sport. Um, but again, it's another of a long list um, of right wing political solutions uh, to problems that don't exist. And um, I hope Caitlyn Jenner winds up tapping into some empathy that may or may not be inside her, but we will see. Um, speaking of things we will see, uh, we're, in the, we're in the home stretch <laughs> and uh, we're about to find out who's in and out on what. But before we do that, we have a way too early prediction uh, from Dave Zirin. Um, Dave, again, was the one who uh, successfully predicted that the European Footy Super League would fall apart because of fan backlash. Um, Dave Zirin, what is your way too early prediction? Well, it's not that Caitlyn Jenner is going to discover empathy. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> my, my way too early prediction is just expect a lot of news coverage as May 16th approaches of the new Basketball Africa League, which is a terrific concept by the NBA to develop talent on the African continent. I mean, you think of folks like Joel Embiid, Pascal Siakam, they've actually inspired a new generation of basketball players. The, the problem and the issue that you're gonna hear about is that the first game is gonna be staged in Kigali, Rwanda. Uh, under the auspices of a leader, Paul Kagame, who is under a great deal of pressure and protest due to human rights violations, uh, including the imprisonment of Paul Rusesa Bajina, who people might know from the movie Hotel Rwanda, as played by Don Cheadle. Now, these are complicated issues, um, and I can tell you from having written about it that people are very passionate on both sides of the of the question in terms of people who support Kagame and people who see him as a murderous dictator. And it's going to lead to a lot of questions about to the NBA where the question is asked, and it was just asked by Paul Rusesa Bajina's wife in an open letter to Adam Silver, where she said, look, I, I believe in what the NBA is trying to do. And I believe that Black Lives Matter to the NBA. Our lives in Rwanda need to matter to the NBA also. So uh, my prediction is just that this is not just going to be something that I wrote about in an article or that we're discussing on this podcast, but I think it's going to break out to be something that's the subject of a lot more discussion as May 16th approaches. Hey, good stuff. Dave, Megan, how close are you following this? Oh, honestly, I, I wasn't before Dave had brought it up in our production meeting, but I'll de it's definitely something that I'm going to keep my eye on because I think it's, you know, to Dave's point, a conversation that needs to be had, not just within, you know, BAL, but, globally it's it's something that we saw quite frankly leading up as well too to the kentucky derby with uh the favorite that didn't end up winning essential quality and essential uh, quality's owner uh sheikh mohammed uh and and everything that has to do with the human rights and civil civil rights that for decades people have been crying out with regards to him about um and his his daughters so it's definitely something that i'll keep my eye on and i think globally we should be yeah, absolutely. And and I think what people have to keep in mind, too, is that the NBA, they're going to go where the resources are, uh, regardless of whether or not the place with the resources has a really spotty or egregious record uh, on human rights. Like this was the genesis of the big NBA versus China versus Daryl Morey versus somehow LeBron James conflict a couple years back. And so in this case, you know, the, the, the resources talent. And uh, if Kagami is the person facilitating uh, this league, the NBA will find a way to plug its nose or hold its nose and go do business over there. If you know uh, this Africa League is is a priority, which uh, all indications are that it is. So Dave has put that on our on our on our radar. His way too early prediction that there's going to be a lot of uh, coverage over this. So we wait to see. Uh, in the meantime, Southern Hemisphere.
New Zealand All Blacks. Uh, the New Zealand New Zealand's rugby union has approved selling a 12 and a half percent stake uh, of their organization, which is valued at 2.2 billion dollars, to a private equity group from California. And so, whatever two, tw- whatever 12 and a half percent of uh, 2.2 billion dollars is, that's the size of the check that the private equity guys want to write to um, own a piece of the storied New Zealand All Blacks. Uh, but the players' union is vehemently against this deal they do not want private equity uh in their union at all uh megan peak are you in or out but at, sorry and here's some important context the new zealand rugby union uh, is operating at nearly a 20 million dollar loss because of the fact uh because of the pandemic because the number of exhibitions they play has been curtailed because domestic uh rugby uh has you know, took a break during the pandemic. But Megan McPeak, are you in or out on private equity writing a big check to New Zealand's rugby union uh, to keep the All Blacks party going? So while I was out with regards to the Super League a couple episodes ago, I'm in on this, but only Mm -hmm. if the players' union agrees to it. At the end of the day, the players play the game and they put their bodies on the line for this. So if the uh, equity partners want a stake, the players need to be on board. I will 1,000% always support the players mm-hmm. being part of the discussion and part of the decision. So if they're out on this, I'm with the players and I stand with the players. Okay, perfect. Uh, Dave Zyron, you in or out on uh, on uh, the private equity guys writing a big check, C-H-E, their Southern Hemisphere, Commonwealth, C-H-E-Q-U-E uh, to the All Blacks. Mm. Yeah, I- I'm... Uh- a thousand percent with what Megan just said. I would only add that I'd be only in for the comedy factor because we all know these hedge funds, they're, when they buy into, and we've seen this with the European uh, soccer situation, like they, they can't just be silent partners. No. And I'm going to guess that these hedge fund folks don't know the first thing about rugby or even possibly where New Zealand is on a map. <laughs> and so the thought of them emerging from their silent partnership and trying to project <laughs> their, their American sports values on New Zealand rugby to me might be high comedy. So I, I'm in for the comedic factor. I'm out on the actual purchase unless the players are down. I'm picturing all the private equity guys showing up at a Blue Jays game uh, talking about, well, you told me the game was in Dunedin. Like, wrong Dunedin, guys. Um, <laughs> look at the bottom of the map. Uh, here's the thing is that the All Blacks, uh, are like a money making machine. I was doing a story a few years ago about, uh, you know, uh, Canada's rugby team and they were getting ready to host, I think it was Italy here in Toronto. And I remember talking to, to an operations guy about booking the All Blacks. And he's like, yeah, well, the conversation starts to book the All Blacks. The conversation starts at a million dollars. You show them a million dollars up front and then we can talk. And then it's, it's very much like boxing. You get your, like the, the union gets their million dollars up front um, that's their guarantee. And then they get a split of the revenue that comes after in terms of the ticket sales and everything else that comes after they come to your town. So you you cancel a bunch of these ex- exhibitions the way the pandemic has. Uh, that's a lot of money from their top line that just disappears, but they still have expenses. Uh, my big So I understand the fact that they feel like they need an infusion of cash because they don't know when the next time uh, they'll be able to have a postseason tour is again. But... Uh, <laughs> What I don't look forward to is the private equity group selling off naming rights to this or to that. And what you don't want is the uh, the uh, pregame players line up for the uh, haka. For, for the State Farm Insurance haka, right? Uh, <laughs> man, which is right. where we're headed. <laughs> that would yeah, be a shame. That's what we don't want is is weapon essentially weaponizing tradition. Last topic. Uh, my Chicago Bears traded up the draft Justin Fields, which is insane. The Bears don't do bold stuff. The Bears don't do smart stuff. Here they made a move that was bold and smart, um, and they drafted a quarterback. The problem is in March, uh, when they signed Andy Dalton, who was a solid NFL quarterback, but not someone you're necessarily trying to stake your future on, but whoever the social media person is at the Bears, they tweeted this picture of Andy Dalton with the with the word with the with the digits QB1. Um, and then six weeks later, they draft another guy who is 
uh, Justin Fields is not coming there to be QB2, and they're not going to pay him QB2 money. Uh, so my question to you, Megan, we'll start. Are you in or out on Justin Fields starting the NFL season as the Bears' number one quarterback, and given that they already have, according to Twitter, QB1? Yes. Like, it's, you didn't you didn't trade up in the draft in the first round, especially to get as close to the top 10 as possible to draft a kid to have him sit and and be second <laughs> fiddle to Andy Dalton. Um, but it's funny because on the the show that I do here in D.C., this a sports betting show that we do, I actually had to do a mock draft and I had the Bears trading up actually going into the 10th spot. So I was one spot off them trading up to go and get a QB because my best friend like you, Morgan, is a huge Chicago Bears fan, is from Chicago, uh, is actually going back to do a book signing. Uh, so yeah, I had that trade happening. I was just one spot off. <laughs> the mock draft industrial complex is out of control. <laughs> this is insane. Dave Zyron, you in or out on Justin Fields beginning the season as a starting quarterback? Well, I'm all in. You mentioned all the things that the Chicago Bears don't usually do. The other thing they don't usually do is draft black quarterbacks. No. Uh, the, the number of black quarterbacks who've played for the Bears, I mean, you can literally count them on one hand, one of them being legendary Canadian football player Henry Burris, who never yes. really got a shot. Uh, with the Bears. So shout out to Henry Burris and and also shout out to the end of a very ugly tradition in Chicago in terms of who actually gets to go behind center. I think Justin Fields, and I've been saying this for months, is the most talented person in this draft, period. That's my too early prediction there. And I think if the Chicago Bears have him starting game three or game one, that will prove out in practice. I think it's a great situation for him. The city of Chicago is absolutely on fire with joy and uh, put him in there. Let's see what the young man can do. Perfect. Uh, and shout out to, to Henry Burris. And because I, I thought you were going to mention Vince Evans and a lot of people forget that Henry, CFL star Henry Burris had his cup of coffee in Chicago. Um, and I think he also wore number one, which Justin Fields is going to wear. Uh, I am out on Justin Fields starting the season as the quarterback only as a starting quarterback, only because I think Bears management is going to look people in the eye um, with a straight face all summer and say there is no starter yet. It's mm -hmm. an open competition. Uh, Andy Dalton was here first, um, but it's an open competition. We don't gift anything to anyone. Justin Fields is going to have to earn it, just like anyone else. And they're going to get about a game and a half into the regular season. Think, uh, think, um, think Cleveland with Tyrod Taylor and Baker Mayfield. Think the Chargers with Tyrod Taylor and Justin Herbert. So Andy Dalton's going to get out there. Yeah, we told you you're QB1. We didn't lie. All right, get out there and lead us to victory. And after about six quarters, you'll see Justin Fields uh, on the sideline <laughs> warming up. And then that'll be that. That'll be the end of the Andy Dalton era and the beginning of the Justin Fields era. Um, and right now, that's the end of my favorite 40 or so minutes uh, of the week. We look forward to these Monday morning meetups. Uh, every week we get together uh, on Bring It In. If you guys like what you're watching, uh, hit like, hit subscribe, uh, leave a comment. Um, tell us what you think online, hashtag bring it in, give us your ideas for uh, in or out segments. We are open to hearing it, all engagements matter. Uh, Dave Zyron, in the meantime, tell the people where they can find you. Well, you could always reach me over Twitter at Edge of Sports, and you could also see me at the Fifth Street Gym, but if you see me, please be <laughs> kind. It's been a while. <laughs> Wait, Fifth Street Gym in Miami? No. <laughs> <laughs> not, not even close. We're like fifth in Florida Avenue in DC. Perfect. Well, you still got Florida. That's perfect. Megan McPeak, uh, yeah. in between episodes of Ring It In, where can the people find you? Always on Twitter at Megan McPeak, spelt with an H because it's the right way. And apparently, before we started recording, that was trending on Twitter, and I don't even know why. Because the people knew we were recording, man. They wanted to hear more <laughs> from you. Perfect. Um, I, as always, am your host, Morgan Campbell. I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Morgan P. Campbell. Uh, if my soleus muscles cooperate, you might see me again soon running through the parks of Ajax, Ontario. Um, but that's a question for another week. Uh, until then, this has been one more episode of Bring It In with Morgan Campbell. I'm your host, Morgan Campbell, and we will see you guys next week.